forbidden fruit. No, I am not talking about the apple in the Garden of Eden. I'm talking about vehicles that are available to buy in some parts of the world, but not others. And if you spend any time on sites like Jalopnik or bring a trailer, you are bound to see that term used time and time again to describe cars that aren't traditionally on sale in your home market, but are so gosh darned cool that you lust after them anyway. And don't lie to me, I've seen your Google browser window. I know that there's at least one car you've got on a forbidden fruit list that gets you all hot and sweaty because you know you can't have it, but you really, really want to own one. Or at least just get a chance to drive one. Everyone's personal forbidden fruit list is different, and it will depend on where you are in the world. For example, some KCAST cars that were sold and imported to the UK might be difficult to get hold of, but they aren't officially forbidden fruit, as you can actually still buy them, albeit with a complicated purchase process. But those same KCAST cars in the US? They are truly forbidden fruit, completely illegal to permanently import and daily drive until they're 25 years old or more. And in parts of the world like Australia, for example, any car that isn't right-hand drive is pretty much considered verboten. Oh, one second, excuse me. Hello? Yeah, yeah, this is she. Yeah, I'm, I'm recording it now. Yeah, I'm talking about forbidden fruit. I am talking about forbidden fruit. I'm explaining why you can't just import a car. How are you listening? Siri? Your BFF with Tim Cook? Okay, yes, all right, no, I know I said that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll tell them. Yes, I'll make sure they know. I know that's not, okay, yes, I'll tell them. All right, goodbye. Sorry about that. Technically what I just said wasn't true. You can theoretically import cars younger than 25 years old to the US, you can theoretically import left-hand drive cars into Australia, but the red tape and costs associated with it are so freaking expensive that, well, you would probably need to have a couple million in the bank to make it possible. But I'll come to all of that in a second. Let's cut to the chase and answer the question that so many of you have been asking me over the last 10 plus years that I've been talking to cameras about electric vehicles. How come cars like the Renault Zoe, the Volkswagen ID3, or the Opel e Corsa aren't offered for sale in North America? How come Europe's affordable mid-range electric cars aren't available for sale everywhere in the world? Why can't you just import a super affordable $3,000 electric car from China and use it to go and get groceries? And why can't you just head to wherever your dream vehicle happens to be, buy it, and then pay someone to ship it back to the US or Canada or New Zealand or the UK or wherever else you happen to be. In a word, rules. Lots and lots of rules. And no, these rules are not meant to be broken. These days, those rules are so complicated and interwoven that anyone wanting to produce a car that meets them has to spend upwards of hundreds of thousands on homologation, a term that I will explain in a second. Without doing so, they won't get the stamp of approval or a little piece of paper that says, yes, these cars can be sold in whichever market they're trying to be sold in. You see, each market around the world has its own regulations and requirements for what cars, motorcycles, and other wheeled vehicles must have in order to be considered road legal. Those regulations are long and complicated and have morphed and changed over the last 100 plus years that we've been driving around in metal boxes with wheels. And almost every single country around the world has its own set of regulations governing what is and isn't okay. Usually, these regulations cover things like where the lights must go and what colour those lights need to be. They cover things like seatbelt and airbag requirements, what types of wheels and tyres are allowed, and, of course, how much pollution the car can chuck out of its exhaust. Automakers seeking to sell their car in a particular market must meet the requirements for that market. If their car doesn't meet those requirements, then the automaker can either choose to modify their vehicle or just not to sell it there. If you want an example of an automaker which decided to not bother to sell their car in a new market, we only have to look at the Citroen CX of the 1970s through early 90s. 
a car that was designed from the get-go with sophisticated hydropneumatic suspension. It was way ahead of its time. It had suspension that could raise or lower the car's ride height, something which upset US regulators at the time as they all wanted cars to have their bumpers at a fairly uniform height, and a car that could raise and lower its suspension at the driver's command it didn't meet that requirement. So until the US regulations were changed, Citroen just didn't sell the CX here. Completely re-engineering the car to meet regulations made absolutely zero sense, especially to the French. For an example, though, of a regulation which required an automaker to actually modify their vehicles, let's look at my all-time favourite British classic car, the humble Morris Minor. You see, the original Morris Minor design, as penned by Sir Alec Isagonis in the 1940s, had the headlights at grille height. That design, which would later be called the low-light Morris Minor by enthusiasts, was sold around the world and even made it to Canada. But when the Morris Minor was being imported to the US, those pesky regulators said, stop right there. Those cars' headlights are too low. You must raise them up or you can turn right around and head back over the Atlantic and give up the idea of selling your tiny little poached egg here. The team at Nuffield Motors, the company that owned Morris at the time, sat down, probably had a little smoke, it was the 1940s after all, and then they came up with a solution. They changed the shape of the wing of the Morris Minor to move the headlight up far enough that it met US regulations. Back then, the US market was too big of an opportunity to miss, especially for a British firm in post-war Britain, and thus the new wing design was used on all imported Morris Miners destined for the US. Initially, those wings were made in the US upon arrival, but later on the design of all Morris Minor wings were changed to ensure compliance with US federal regulations, as well as reducing parts complexity. Ingenuity. Don't you love it? As time has progressed and cars have become more and more complicated, the laundry list of requirements that each automaker must satisfy for every single new model that comes to market gets longer and longer. And in every market, these requirements are different because even in markets where there is supposed to be consensus between different countries on a common standard, everyone wants something different. What was once a case of making sure the car met lighting and basic safety standards is now a complicated tomb of intricate requirements governing everything from the emergency door operating procedures and tailpipe routing through to headlight beam patterns, airbag deployment, and warning labels. Ever wondered why American cars make so much noise when you don't put your seatbelt on, or when you open the door and the car is in gear, or when you leave your key in the ignition? Those are all safety regulations that must be satisfied before the car is given the seal of approval to be sold here. That's homologation. Homologation literally being the fancy word referring to the process of receiving official approval. In this case, official approval to sell a car in a particular market. But Nikki, I hear you say, surely you can just change a few light bulbs or light lenses to make sure a car has the correct signals from my home market. Surely you can just make a conversion gauge for the speedometer to make sure it reads in miles rather than kilometres, or vice versa. Well, yeah, yeah, you can. That's all you used to have to do. But that's only part of a modern homologation process. The other part, which is synonymous in the auto industry with homologation, is the hundreds of thousands of dollars that automakers, or indeed anyone seeking to import a new car to a new market, must spend in order to prove to regulators that yes, this car meets crash test safety standards. And the only way to prove that is to put the car through crash tests. All of them. Multiple times. When an automaker is readying a new car for market, they put pre-production cars through exhaustive crash tests to demonstrate that those cars meet all of the requirements of the regulation in each market. That requires many, many cars to be crushed, maimed and destroyed so that their crash test performance can be examined in a variety of different scenarios. And different countries require different tests, so for each market you might need to do a different combination of frontal, side impact with barriers and poles for occupants with and without seatbelts. In some markets, automakers are expected to self-certify. In others, crash tests are carried out by independent third-party groups. But without crash test certification, these cars cannot be sold. And in some places, it also means they can't even be individually imported. But to be fair, different markets have different regulations. 
Sometimes in some markets, crash test compliance and tests are waived if the number of vehicles being imported or produced is under a certain threshold, as long as there is a more basic compliance to regulations present. And in some markets, you can import so-called grey market cars, as long as you are a private individual or someone importing cars in very limited numbers. And as I hinted earlier, in some markets, just having the steering wheel on the wrong side of the car is an instant failure. The only way cars can be imported in this situation is if there is a local importer who is familiar with the regulations and can design and get approval for an official conversion kit. In Australia, for example, there is a whole cottage industry built up about making right-hand conversions, allowing Australians with enough money the ability to import US market cars that are left-hand drive and then have them professionally converted to right-hand drive so they are actually road legal. But in the US, the only way for an individual to import a car that's under 25 years old is to get a letter or certificate of compliance from the car company that made your car, stating it meets federal safety standards. It must list your car's exact vehicle identification number or VIN. This is something our very own Kate Walton Elliott attempted to do for her first generation IMEV when she emigrated to the US. Mitsubishi was keen to help, but then quickly realised that her pre-production Japanese market car didn't meet US standards and ended up telling her it wasn't possible. And when I tried to do the same thing with my right-hand drive European market Nissan Leaf, Nissan said that I could get a letter, but then also said it would be complicated and expensive. So I sold my car and then bought a new one when I came here. And yeah, I know, the Leaf is sold in North America and in Europe. But the European one is made for Europe, even though mine was made in Japan, and there are significant differences between cars made for different markets. So though US Leafs met US crash test and compliance requirements, my European market one didn't, and I would have been forced to make some expensive modifications and maybe crash a handful of them to prove that it did. If you still want that forbidden fruit EV and you can't get her a letter of compliance, then you will have to buy a couple dozen or more cars and then crash them multiple times to prove that yes, this car meets all of the crash test standards. But that's out of the budget for most normal people though. You could always petition the automaker in question to start selling your car in your home market. That might work, especially if you could, oh, I don't know, drum up oodles of support from like-minded individuals. But even then, a car company won't commit to spending hundreds of thousands on homologation if their own research suggests there isn't a market for the model, they don't yet have a base of operations, or there's a rival in that market which would metaphorically wipe the floor with them if they tried. The only time you might get that happen is compliance cars. Because then automakers are surprisingly okay about spending lots of money to bring a vehicle to market even if there only are going to be a handful of them sold because that's better than spending millions of dollars paying fines for not making an EV in the first place. But I'm getting a little bitter and I'm not sure that's good for my long QT syndrome, so... Helpful side note, there has been talk of a worldwide standard for crash tests and other things for years, but you only have to watch a UN meeting to realise that if we can't agree on which nation is in violation of a particular treaty and who started a particularly nasty bout of mass genocide against their sworn enemies, even if it's blatantly obvious to a flea with three functioning neurons, we are unlikely to get the auto industry and associated governments around the world to play ball on a single set of standards. So far then, I have dashed your hopes and dreams. I'm sorry, but if you're truly honestly eager to get your dream car into your home market, there might be a couple exceptions. First, you could technically import it temporarily. This is a legally grey area and it would mean that you'd probably have to destroy or export the car again afterwards. And good luck finding an insurance company willing to insure your car. But this is how people touring the world on their motorcycles or in their motorhomes do it. They get a very special customs book that allows them to drive non-compliant cars in other countries for a limited period of time. It is how Ewan McGregor and Charlie Borman and their awesome cameraman Claudio von Planter rode motorcycles around the world and how the rest of the Long Way team took their UK registered support trucks with them for the ride. But this loophole doesn't let you import a car permanently. 
One loophole which might is the special collector car regulations that many but not all countries have. They would allow you to import non-compliant cars and even register them in some places as a special collector or exhibitor vehicles. But these vehicles come with some pretty strict requirements. You can't just sell them to regular people like you and me. And while you are allowed to put them in museums, you're also allowed to drive them a few hundred miles every year. So not great for importing that Renault Zoe from Europe to the US then. Automakers also get special dispensation. Renault, thanks to its partnership with Nissan, actually has a number of European spec vehicles in the San Francisco Bay Area running around on the roads. I have seen and ridden in a Renault Zoe and a Renault Megane on US roads, but only as a passenger because regulations about imported vehicles require them to be driven by an employee of the automaker, specially registered, and lest you get any ideas, exported or destroyed once their useful work has been done. And if you are in active military, some countries allow you to bring your home cars with you because... Actually, I don't know. I put a sarcastic comment in here, but honestly, if you do know, answer us on a postcard, please. The final way is to wait until your vehicle is over a certain age. Some countries, including the US, have an age requirement after which all of those regulations just seem to poof, vanish away, and you could probably import an age-appropriate bedstead with wheels and a motor and a couple of seats and a seatbelt, and you'd be okay. It is almost as if there is some kind of protectionist behaviour going on, but democracies wouldn't do that, right? But there are also problems with this. The 25-year-old rolling rule in the US, for example, means that some model years of Land Rover Defender, which was legal for a while in the US, then became illegal because its then 50 plus year old design didn't meet crash test requirements, are legally importable. But the most recent examples still aren't, and that leads people trying to cheat the system by making newer cars look older. And that leads to crushing of cars when they arrive at customs, because the customs people believe it isn't as old as claimed. And that's sad. Very, very sad. I don't think I would import a car that had a risk of that happening to it. So there you have it. You might be lucky, some markets do let you import EVs from elsewhere in the world if you jump through enough hoops, but most of them? Forget it. That's it for today. Please do hit subscribe and the bell if you haven't, as it does seem to stop YouTube from doing weird things with our content, and make sure that you're subscribed to both Transport Evolved Take 2 and Transport Evolved Shorts, as well as this one, and there are links below. Thanks on behalf of the entire T crew, go out to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month patrons, that's Guido Drahoa, Brophy Wolf, Anonymous Freak, Regine Fellows, Kyle Hodgson, Gordon C, Paul Conway, Laura Sanborn, Anthony Coates, Denny Hyde, Sean Ueda, and Tuzzler in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters. They are John Lyons, Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Will Graylin, and Ian. If you would like to join the ranks of wonderful supporters, and who wouldn't, you'll find links below to Patreon, Bitcoin, and Kofi. You can chat with the team and TE fans over at Discord. And if you want to buy some TE swag, just point yourself over to our Red Bubble store. Our new pride designs, like this one, are now in stock, and proceeds from this month go to the Trevor Project. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!